when you look at a, a beautiful painting or a sculpture of, of a landscape and you would think that well surely that's just a product of the mind you know it's not a real thing and then on a beautiful misty frosty day you know you see this picture perfect landscape and you think there it is right in front of you When I did my first solo exhibition at the Crescent of the Moons, I started thinking about how time and memory affect the landscape, both external and internal. And I came up with a whole series of sort of um, sculptures, mindscapes. They were all sort of charred black, and I was looking at them as a sort of three-dimensional silhouettes. That was the kind of the, the start of something. A couple of years later, when I was proposed the opportunity to make public art, I wanted to push that idea forward and collect these sort of verbalizations from people and then reimagine them. All these stories were sort of woven together to come up with a singular scene. That's how I describe mindscapes. Saad's work, you know, really resolutely held that space. So I could see that he definitely was able to take those next ambitious steps in his practice. At Yorkshire Sculpture Park, we do a lot of work around that really sort of deep-rooted interconnectedness between people, landscape and art. And seeing Saad's work, it seemed that there were elements of all of those things that really kind of spoke to me quite strongly. The idea that the landscapes that form us, the landscapes that we grow up in, are so much a part of us that we can't help but take them with us and sort of carry them in our minds and um, that we can always go back to those places in our mind's eye. When he came to visit the sculpture park, he went to see the chapel for the first time, which had been renovated a few years previously. I think that really fired up something within Saad and he spoke to me soon afterwards about the fact that he had this idea for a project about paradise. You never know how an artist is going to respond to a space really, but trust is extremely important and I think over a period of time we've built this relationship with Saad that allows you to know that somebody is really going to respond in an exciting way. I travelled across the country um, and I wanted to ask people uh, to describe their version of paradise. You know, it was not just about a feeling, but to, to give me a description of a physical space that they, that they think of as paradise. There were these two main categories that, that came out. One was this kind of heavenly paradise, and then there was this kind of earthly paradise, this utopian vision that we can all work towards and make a a paradise here and now. And I think that it was these kind of contrasting stories and and um, uh, descriptions that I found really fascinating that I wanted to kind of then weave together into a, a, a series of mindscapes. I was born in a in a very religious household, like very religious household, you know. My, my grandparents and parents, you know, praying and attending all the religious activities and everything all the time. Um, and paradise really did form the backdrop of my upbringing. And there were all these set rules that, you know, you have to do this and, you know, be that kind of a person. You know, there is this idealistic um, character that you, you have to kind of really mould yourself into in order to gain uh, admission in paradise. I got to the universities and really expanded my social circle. The paradise the other people spoke of was so radically different from mine and not necessarily better or worse, but just so different. And that, that's really fascinating. For example, my, you know, a lot of my Hindu friends talked about reincarnation. You know, you can keep trying until you get in there. <laughs> so, uh, but whereas, you know, it's like this is it, you know. That's the kind of the belief that I was brought up with. The work took on so many different forms and changed so many times as he was thinking it through. Um, but to be part of that process was something very special. Um, and I know Saad was so kind of critically concerned with, with the scale of the space and how his work was going to sit within that. 
the three main sculptures, I wanted to make sure that each one has uh, like an environment of its own. On one of them, I, I, I kind of hosted all the more manageable expectations of paradise. Little cottages and, and, and only country houses that were sort of, you know, it was all very residential and, and communal, you know, like it was all like little colonies of places that people wanted to live together um, in, in a community. Um, and then there were all these higher expectations of paradise where people were talking about, you know, towers and palaces. There was a whole group of that and I wanted to kind of then keep them all together. And then everything in between, I thought, should go on one of the sculptures. So I think that's how I should divide the stories. As an artist, you have to be a, a confident maker. So it's kind of more discovery. You know, you, you play and manipulate materials and then hopefully you will discover something within that. I need to love what I do and, and bring the joy of making in the work. I'm not a politician, you know. <laughs> I can leave that to them and I can just enjoy making things and, and hopefully spread a bit of beauty and peace through the work and not necessarily do anything preachy, which has never works, in my opinion. Paradise is it has become more of a metaphor and ultimately we all want to get to the same place, um, you know, and whether that's just a utopian vision of this world here and now or whether it is something like a physical place that we would get to when we die. Fuck knows, but, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's interesting. So I'd worked in the chapel for about two weeks. Um, once the main forms of the work were in there and were all kind of pieced together and completed, and then the smaller elements were added. So it was as though we were kind of all seeing it for the first time. The work hadn't existed in its complete form until it was finished in the chapel. It was nerve-wracking, you know, because I, I, though I, I, I wanted to believe the fact that it was going to work and, and all, everything was going to gel together, there was no guarantee. The chapel is something very special. It's a building that was made in the 1740s as a family chapel. We're very sensitive to the history of the place and also just the qualities of the building. And this installation really shows an artist who understands space and understands scale and understands volume in a room. It's very particular. Suddenly to see the work with the shadows and um, the way that the, the sun kind of passes across the work through the course of the day and, and these incredible effects of, of light and shadow and texture that you get in the space of the chapel. Um, it's all something that you can't really fully anticipate until the work's in place. There's almost a sense that they don't have a skin, that you're looking at the material from which they've been made, which is an important kind of sculptural concept. They are held by it, they're engaged by it. They're spending a lot of time in the space. I think people are definitely relating it to their own lives. And obviously there are so many human stories in that work that you can see that human connection on a very deep-rooted level. The ladder, the airship, the night jewel, which is the, the, the moon, these have all come out of stories that I've collected. Maybe you can bring your own narrative to, the, uh, to these particular elements in the show. There's a number of times that I've gone back to the chapel to see the work. Um, I feel I've done my, my, my bet, my, my job, and, and now the work has to you know, take a take a life of its own. Mm -hmm.